Welcome to the Love Thy Neighbor Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Anthony Wilson. Today on Love Thy Neighbor, we're going to dive into the subject of where do demons come from? In Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through 25, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went out through all Syria, and they brought to him all sick who were afflicted with various disease and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee to Capolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Matthew chapter 8. Verse 16, when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all those who were sick. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. Then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. This epic battle between Jesus and evil spirits, demons, even his followers were given power to deal with these entities. But where did they come from? Where do demons come from? And why are there so many at the time of Jesus and so little throughout the rest of the Bible? Today on the Love Thy Neighbor Podcast Network, we're going to dive into this subject. Where do demons come from? Support the Love Thy Neighbor Podcast Network at anchor.fm slash anthony dash wilson slash support. Again, anchor.fm slash anthony dash wilson slash support if you'd like to give a one-time gift go to dollar sign a wilson 2273 on your cash app god bless you so where do demons come from how do we answer this question how do we deal with Uh, This very uh, controversial right now. A a lot of you probably are thinking, well, how is it controversial? Well, there is a lot of debate on where demons come from. And a lot of it is because of the Second Temple period um, books uh, that are pseudepigrapha or apocrypha. um, Books like uh, Enoch, uh, Jubilees, uh, Tobit, Barak. These different books that have uh, these interesting ideas about demons that uh, the Bible doesn't actually agree with. Now, I believe that the biblical writers were well informed and they knew um, what was being written about and what was being said. And the things that they believed agreed with the Holy Spirit who guided them and directed them in writing Uh, the New Testament, uh, they accepted those things and they incorporated those things and they were uh, used within the text of the New Testament. But a lot of what we find in these extra biblical, non-canonical, intertestamental, second temple period books um, are not in agreement with the full council of what we read in the Bible. And a lot of scholars and a lot of lay people alike, a lot of Bible enthusiasts, Bible nerds, different people are uh, using these extra biblical books to interpret what the Bible is saying. Now, the, one of the first uh, things that we learn in exegesis is that the Bible interprets itself. Uh, that thing, a thing cannot mean what it never meant, and it must mean what it meant to the original audience. And we cannot manipulate the text or change the text. And so what the biblical writers wrote about in the New Testament is what we have to work with um, 
and even the historical books, some of these books uh, like Enoch and Jubilees and Tobit and different ones, uh, they do give you a feel for what is going on in history, um, how words were used in history. Uh, they're a great cross reference for um, how uh, the word was used in that time period. But when we when it comes down to reading the Bible, those of us that live our life by the word of God, who want to see life through the lens of scripture, um, we cannot be caught up in books that are uh, opposed to the Bible that we read. In a lot of ways, there are things that can be confirmed in these other books, but they are not teaching the same thing that our Bible is teaching. You know, and I don't want to get into how the canon came about. You know, people want to talk about the Council of Nicaea and all those kinds of things. But the Council of Nicaea is not um, really how the Bible was brought about. Uh, those people at that council uh, were scholars and they knew the word of God. And some people say, well, um, Constantine made them put these books in there. No, Constantine knew nothing about it. He wasn't even a Christian. Constantine was a politician and he was trying to bring unity uh, to his his rule, his empire. And part of that was they had to go settle what was going on as far as this rift in what books were legitimate and what books weren't. And you need to do your own study on that. You know, they had some major points that uh, allowed uh, the books of the Bible to be uh, legitimized and it had to be proven and tested uh, that it was written by a prophet or someone directly connected to a prophet or by an apostle or someone directly connected to uh, the first century apostles. Um, a lot of these books, they date so far away from the original author, and that's why they're called pseudepigrapha, which means they are not by that author. We know that Enoch did not write the book of Enoch, but the different authors that did write Enoch, because there's uh, not just the book of Enoch, but there's first and second Enoch. And, 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 and there's a lot of uh, writers like that. Um, that did not write the book, the Gospel of Thomas, the, the, you know, the Acts of Peter and different different books that the, the, the author's name that is attributed to it is not the author. And that's why they were not accepted, not they weren't taken out or wasn't any conspiracy. It's just that you couldn't prove who wrote that book. And so how can you base your faith off of something that you can't even prove who wrote that book? Whereas these books that are uh, in the Bible that are in the canon uh, were vetted and proven and textual criticism was made, uh, archaeological criticism was made. Um, they worked hard to figure out uh, what books remained. Linguistic studies, literary studies were done uh, because if you look at you know, primary sources. That's what we want. We want primary sources. A lot of these books are built off of second and third, and, and they're built off of arguments that um, aren't consistent with scripture. And they come to conclusions that actually disagree with the rest of the Bible. And that's how we got what we got. One of those topics is demons. So I'm only going to use the Bible. I'm only going to use the Bible. That's how we're going to understand this. We're going to go to the word of God, the Bible that we trust, the Bible that we believe in. And we're going to look at the evolution of the term demon, um, how uh, Old Testament, New Testament, uh, where uh, the evolution of this terminology comes. Uh, when you look at the Old Testament, the term demon is only used two times in the Hebrew scripture. Two times, and it's the word shahed, shad. And it's uh, 770, 700, 7700, <laughs> my apologies, in your strong coordinates for my studiers who study with me. And if you're listening to my podcast and you don't use the strongs, and you don't have your Bible open when I'm saying things, uh, shame on you because you need to be checking what I'm saying. 
The Bible says to test all things and cleave to that which is good. The Bible talks about the Bereans, that even though Paul was a great preacher and teacher, they still searched the scriptures to make sure that what Paul was saying was so. And that's what we need to do with everybody, myself included. And so, uh, Shahed or Shed, uh, 7700 in your Strong's Concordance. And it actually says probably demon because it's a borrowed word. It's from a foreign language. It's on loan from the Assyrians, Sedu. And it comes from an Assyrian um, legend of a protecting spirit, especially the bull of Colossus. So this was a protecting spirit compared to the Aramaic. The Aramaic uses the term demon um, and is perhaps a Phoenician proper name. Um, in Arabic, uh, the same term that is used for demon is used to rule um, and it is used for foreign gods, new gods, foreign gods. Um, so this term demon is very interesting, um, only used twice in the Hebrew Bible. One of the most significant places is Deuteronomy chapter 32. And Deuteronomy chapter 32 is a very important passage because this is Moses, the song of Moses. Moses is um, getting ready to pass the torch to Joshua and Moses um, lifts up this song, a prophetic word, um, recounting and prophesying uh, things that uh, did happen and would happen. And specifically in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 16. Uh, it says they provoked him being him being God to jealousy with their foreign gods. Now, remember the great uh, the commandment number four or no, fam, commandment number one. You should not you shall you shall not have any other gods before me. Right. You shall not have any other gods before me. And the Israelites, the people of Israel uh, provoked the Lord to jealousy with foreign gods, with abominations. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons. That's what it says in the Hebrew text. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 17. They sacrificed to demons, not to God. To gods that they did not know. To new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. And this was the beginning of something um, that was going to be pervasive throughout the New Testament. Or throughout the Old Testament, excuse me. Um, that they were going to begin to worship other gods. They were going to begin to serve other gods and sacrifice to other gods. And these sacrifices were going to be considered an abomination to the Lord, um, an abomination. Um, one of the places that you see it mostly, uh, Second Kings, Second Kings, In Second Kings. Uh, we see uh, various instances where uh, they begin to sacrifice to other gods. In 2 Kings uh, chapter 21, this is under the rule of Manasseh, verses 4, he built uh, altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. And he, built out, he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Now watch what he did. And also he made his sons pass through the fire, practicing soothsaying, witchcraft, and consulting spiritists and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even set a carved image of Asherah that he made in the house of of which the Lord had said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And so they begin to worship idols and other gods. And uh, in, Dave, in, in, in the Psalms, um, the psalmist Asaph, um, all of the Psalms are not written by David. Um, some of us you know, believe that they are, but all the Psalms are not written by David. It talks about this divine council where God stands in the midst 
of the gods, of the mighty ones. In Psalms 82, uh, beginning at verse 1. The Psalm of Asaph, he said, God stands in the congregation of the mighty ones. He judges among the gods. And this is the word Elohim, among the gods. Elohim. How long would you judge unjustly, show partiality to the wicked, wicked Selah? Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do just to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods, and all of your children, the children of the Most High. But you shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit the nations. So this is a psalm of judgment, um, Asaph. He talks about God standing in the congregation of the mighty, the great ones, the judges. And he judges the gods, these um, demons that Deuteronomy chapter 32 talks about. New gods, foreign gods. Uh, we move forward to Psalms 106. It talks even deeper about how they begin to sacrifice to these demons, to these gods. Psalms 106 and verse 34, we'll start at verse 34. It says, they did not destroy the people concerning whom the Lord had commanded them, but they mingled with the Gentiles and learned their works. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and daughters to demons. Wow. And so these demons in the Old Testament were the gods of the Gentiles, these foreign gods. Um, and these foreign gods, um, in a lot of respects, were uh, angelic beings. Uh, this word gods, Elohim. When we look at Psalms chapter 8, verses 4 and 5, here's what it says. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him for you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. And this term angel is the same term Elohim, which is the term used for gods or the term that is associated with these demons. And so these demons in the Old Testament are angels who are somehow out of order. Um, and it's not that the angels are doing anything as of yet, but it is that the people are worshiping them and trying to manipulate them to do what they want. And so they are offering sacrifices and offerings, uh, trying to get these angels, quote unquote, gods of the nations to obey them and do what they desire. Wow. Isn't that it's crazy? It's crazy. Uh, when you get to the New Testament, this whole terminology changes. It is no longer gods. Not in that sense. The gods are included. The gods of the Gentiles, the foreign gods of the Gentiles are included. But this term demon, and I'm going to do a little um, working backwards. I'm going to start with the term demon, which in your strongs, is 1142 1142 in your strongs this is the word demon and what I'm going to do is I'm going to work backwards all the way to 1139 which is the picture of being demonized and so I'm going to walk you through this process because I want you to really understand what the Bible is saying about demons in the Old Testament it's foreign gods it's um Entities that are being worshipped by the people, um, passing their sons and daughters through the fire, making sacrifices to them, um, teaching them witchcraft and idolatry and all those types of things. And so in the New Testament, though, demons are the adversary of Christ and his mission, but they have no power to stop him. That when Jesus comes on the scene, everything shifts. It's almost as if those demons 
were content and comfortable until Jesus shows up. When Jesus shows up, the demons begin to tremble. They begin to fear. They begin to cry out. They begin to be cast out by Jesus. And so Jesus is coming is a shifting in whatever is going on in the world. And so let's look at this terminology for demon, uh, demonion, uh, 1142 in your strongs, an evil spirit. The conjugate, demohion, is a female noun, a demon, i.e. a fallen angel. Now, I hear so many scholars refuting that demons are not fallen angels. I mean, they go uh, to great lengths to try to prove that demons are not fallen angels and they use everything but the Bible to do it. They use the book of Enoch. They use the book of Jubilees. They'll use the book of Tobit. They'll, they'll use anything but the Bible. But when you read the Bible, where are my Bible readers? We are reading the Bible. The demons that are in the Bible are categorized as fallen angels. Fallen angels. Um, it goes on to see, say, see um, 1139, which we will look at later, later on, demonized, and 1140, little demons. <laughs> um, in a later edition of the critical text, uh, we see these examples. We'll see Revelations 1614, Revelations 18.2. We're not going to get into it right now because I'm just building. I'm working on something. Whereas 1140 emphasizes the evil nature of the fallen angels. 1142 stresses the pervasive presence of demons in the world. Now, under 1142, number one in your lexicon, when it explains, you know, what they are, it says a god, a goddess, an inferior deity. God, a goddess, an inferior deity. Um... These demons, when Jesus shows up, remember, Jesus shows up and he wreaks havoc <laughs> on these demons. Um, there was a man that was possessed. Two, there were two demon possessed men that were healed. And one of them, uh, the demons inside of them begged Jesus in Matthew chapter eight, verse 31. So the demons begged him, saying, if you cast us out, permit us to go away into the swine, into the herd of swine. They begged Jesus. Why are they begging Jesus? Because Jesus is a superior being. That these demons are inferior be beings. Um, then you have in 1141, demon-like or demonic. Demonic. And so something can be demonic, which means... Uh, literally resembling or influenced by one who is devilish, right? And in James, one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite chat passages in James, it talks about demonic or devilish wisdom. That is demonic or devilish wisdom. James chapter three and verse 15 says, this wisdom does not ascend from above. Hmm but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. This wisdom does not descend from above, but it is earthly, sensual, demonic. Why does it not descend from above? Because the spirits, these demons, are have been cast down to the earth. And so their, their wisdom is not coming from the kingdom of God or the place where God is. It's coming from the earth. Because that's where they are. That's where they're stranded. That's where they're cast down to. 1140 in your Strong's, the Greek 1140, demonion, i.e. fallen angel. Demons are powerless against Christ and his plan. This word, demonion, is used 60 times. This is the most uh, popular Greek word used in the New Testament. So this word is going to tell us really what the New Testament writers believe that demons are. So here we go. 60 times this word is used and is used for evil spirits or the messengers and the ministers of the devil. Um, demons enter the body 
They possess and cause suffering with severe disease and they cause uh, people to speak as though they were mad. They were out of their mind. Uh, they actually tried to use this terminology against Jesus in uh, Matthew eleven eighteen, when they said, Jesus, you must have a demon because they felt like he was talking crazy. So their expectation of demons is that you're talking crazy. You're you're not making sense. <laughs> According to the Jewish opinion, which passed over to the Christians. And I'm reading just from our Strong's Strong's 1140, the Greek Strong's. He said, according to the the Jewish opinion, which passed over to the Christians, the demons are the gods of the Gentiles and the authors of idolatry. Now, that does come right out of the the, the Old Testament. That's what we saw in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 32. What did we see? We saw them uh, provoking God to anger because they went after new gods. They were serving new gods, gods that their fathers didn't know. They were offering uh, sacrifices to idols, doing witchcraft. This is consistent with Old Testament and New Testament. Now, there are some people that argue that you've got to go outside the Bible to find out what the Jewish idea of demons were, but it's right there in the Bible. You can stay consistent with what scripture says, you know, um, even the apostle Paul who, uh, taught on idolatry. Uh, he believed that the gods of the nations, uh, were not real, but they were, they were put into people's mind by demonic entities. The demons were the author of this idolatry that people were into. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 4, therefore concerning the things, uh, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God before him. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God the father of whom all things and we for him and one Lord Jesus Christ through him or through whom all things and though and through him we live. And so when he talks about these idols, he says, okay, yeah, even if there were still only one God and see Jesus proves that as you see through the gospels him casting out spirits, him repelling the enemy, right? And so let me give you one more out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 19. It says, uh, what am I saying then? That an idol is anything? Or what is offered to an idol is anything? Rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to what? Demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons, or do you not, or do, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? And so there he is again, using the same old Testament idea that we find in Deuteronomy chapter 32. It is the exact same idea. So it is consistent. We don't have to go outside the Bible to figure out what they believed about demons. So let's read on. We're still in our concordance. Um, Paul believed that it was demons that inspired idolatry and even uh, stirred up false doctrine. Even the false doctrines of the day, Paul said it was demons. First First Timothy chapter four, verse one. Now the spirit expressly says in the latter days, times will uh, latter days. In the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. In the latter days, people will depart depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So there it is again. He believed that there were spirits, that demons are spirits, and they even had the power to influence people. Now, some people are under the mindset of Josephus. Josephus Uh, didn't believe that demons were inhabiting people, but he believed that demons were the spirit of evil men. 
which the New Testament does not agree with. Uh, but that is what Josephus talked about in his Antiquities uh, 7, 6, and 3. Uh, let's keep going. Strong's Concordance number 1139 talks about demons. This is the same terminology. This is demons or demonized coming under the power of a demon, a fallen angel. And if you read it, you go to your Strong's, it's going to say fallen angel. Afflicted with especially severe disease, either um, bodily or mental, such as paralysis, um, blindings, deafness, loss of speech, epilepsy, melancholy, um, insanity, etc. Not just to affect, to afflict with uh, just these diseases or illnesses, but to dethrone the person's reason and take the place of of their thought process that they wanted to own this person and think for them uh, the possession that they possessed and they were accustomed to uh, express the mind and the conscience of the demons dwelling in them and so they began to speak as these spirits they began to speak as the demons not as people any longer and we see that in Luke chapter uh, 8 verse 30 31 Jesus asked the man what's your name and the demon spoke so the man was no longer in control the demons began to speak on his behalf wow <laughs> this, is, this is deep because in the Old Testament you only have a couple of instances where demons are even mentioned but in the New Testament you have this plethora of uh, material where we can understand demons now, here's something that I think is interesting and we should explore. What's the difference between demons and angels? Because a demon is a fallen angel. But what does that even mean? I don't understand what that means. And so as we study, what we find out is that there is a distinct difference between demons and angels. Number one, angels are what we would call corporeal. Corporeal. What do you mean by corporeal? Angels have the ability to do, uh, to deal with material things. They can handle material things. They can appear in a physical form to do things that are physical or material. Whereas demons are incorporeal. They are incapable of doing things that are material or physical. That's why they have to possess a body. They have to work through a body. Now, angels, when you look through the Bible, angels did even bad things. In Genesis chapter 6, angels actually had sex. Okay, that wasn't a figment of the imagination. That wasn't a vision that actually happened because there was offspring produced by it. And so this was physical, whereas a demon in the New Testament, you do not see that. It is not possible for a demon to impregnate a woman in the New Testament. So there's something different between the angels, even the ones that sin in the Old Testament and the demons that are plaguing mankind in the New Testament. Angels were able to eat. In Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, uh, uh, Abraham gets a visit from God. He has two angels with him. And those two angels actually in verse 8, after he prepares the food, they eat it. So they, the angels could actually eat food. Not only could they do physical things uh, like sex, but they could eat food. Genesis chapter 32 Jacob wrestled physically with an angel to the point where this angel broke his hip, <laughs> you know, knocked his hip out of socket. Uh, and you say, well, that's the Old Testament. Uh, angels are different in the New Testament. No, they're not. In the New Testament, Acts chapter 5, uh, verses 19 and 20, an angel comes and frees the apostles from prison and tells them, go and preach the gospel in the synagogue. Go and preach the gospel in the square. Paul is visited by an angel. Um, him and Silas are in a prison. Uh, or Peter, sorry, is in a prison. Not Paul. Peter is in a prison. And the angel unchains him, opens up the door, and lets him out. Um, Joseph 
the husband of Mary is visited by an angel. And these angels are physically there. They are physically there. They are able to affect and touch physical things. As a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2 says that people have entertained angels unaware that angels have been physically in their presence and they didn't even know it. Whereas when we're talking about demons or evil spirits, they're incorporeal. They, they cannot operate apart from taking over someone's body. And I'm going to take you to a passage that has a lot of demonic activity in it, so to speak. Luke chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, um, verse 2, a certain woman who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. <laughs> this one person. Now, if demons were physical beings how could seven of them fit into one person how could they just all just fit these are spiritual beings that do not have a body they do do not materialize physically they are spiritual entities uh let's go down to verse uh verses 26 through 39 i'm not going to read the whole thing but i'm going to start at verse uh 29 it says for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. And he broke the bonds and was driven by the demons into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. When I looked up what a legion is, a legion is over 6,000 men. Look it up. A legion is over 6,000 men. As a matter of fact, an, uh, the infantry is 6,826 men. 6,100 um, men on the ground and then 20, 726 horsemen. This is the term legion. This person had legions. If, if if these were like angels, you couldn't fit all of them into one person. How could you fit over 6,000 physical bodies into one person? So demons are incorporeal. They need a body. They need a body. Angels, both Old Testament and New Testament, appear with their own body and they can uh, uh, touch and feel and grab and do things physically. They're not just spiritual entities. And so we wonder, well, well, okay, if that's true about demons, then what about the devil? Isn't the devil different? Isn't he, you know, a, a dragon, an angel? Well, we only know of a couple of different encounters in the New Testament that are written about where uh, someone sees the devil. And one of them is Jesus when he comes out of the wilderness. Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4 he comes out of the wilderness and he's encountered by the devil. Now it doesn't say that this is a physical encounter. So it, it may be that he doesn't have a body. I don't know. When Jesus says, I beheld Satan fall from fall like lightning from heaven. Once he gets to earth, I don't know if he's the same being uh, that he was previously. Um, but here's what scripture says. Let's take a look at what scripture says. Uh, in John chapter 13, uh, it says that Satan entered Judas. Ah, so maybe he's not a physical being. John chapter 13, verse 26 and 27. Jesus answered, It is he whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. Having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. And Jesus said to him, What you do, do it quickly. Satan entered him. And I want you to check it out. Read it. John chapter 13, verse 27, and Satan entered him. So 
Satan entered him. Just like demons enter people, Satan entered Judas. In Ephesians chapter 2, we find again, Satan most likely is spiritual. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. The spirit. And so Satan, the spirit who works in the sons of disobedience. Uh, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19 says the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. How is he controlling? How is he manipulating a whole world if he's an entity that has a physical body that's physically stationary? No, he's got to be doing it through the spirit realm. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. For we do not what wrestle against flesh and blood. I always read this as we're not wrestling against people, but we're also not wrestling against any being that is flesh and blood, but against uh, principalities and against powers and against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That this battle that Paul is talking about is waged against spiritual hosts of wickedness, powers that are working behind the scenes in the spirit realm, not in the physical realm. Whatever is affected in the physical realm is affected by spiritual beings. That the enemy is coming into people and uh, taking them over, persuading them, manipulating them, influencing them, empowering them. Hmm. Look at Revelations chapter 12. We're going to wrap this thing up. Revelations chapter 12 talks about the war that broke out in heaven. Now, when you look at Revelations chapter 12, we first begin at the beginning of chapter 12. In the beginning of chapter 12, it says, Now a great sign appeared in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out, labor and in pain to give birth and another sign appeared in the heaven a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head and his tail threw, drew down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them down to earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was all ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born And she bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Now watch this. So this picture, a lot of this comes from, a lot of this comes from Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter seven. You got to go and read, read the book of Daniel and you will see all of this imagery. But this particular scene appears to be the birth of Jesus. And so whenever this event of Satan, uh, you know, coming against Jesus, coming against the birth of Christ, this is the event that leads to verse seven. And a war broke out in heaven and Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out and the serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceived the whole world was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice of heaven saying salvation and strength to the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of the brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. And so this this scene that Jesus talks about in Luke chapter uh, 10 and verse 18, where he beheld like lightning, Satan fall to the earth. This was at the time of his coming. And so that's why you see in this New Testament so much demonic ap- activity, so much conflict in the spiritual realm from that point, because 
the war really began when Jesus hit the earth and continues now through the believers in Christ. We know that there were multiple rebellions. The Genesis 6 group of angels, those angels were put under chains. Their sin was so grievous that he didn't want them on the earth. And so he didn't even, he didn't cast them to the earth. He put them under chains according to Jude chapter, Jude verse 6 and 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. But they're under chains till judgment comes. But Satan and his angels have been relegated to the earth to an incorporeal existence where they have no power to defeat Christ or the followers of Christ, those that are in Christ because of what Jesus did. And so now when we look at demons, we look at them in the way that we should, that demons are here to oppose man and to draw them away from God, to oppose the purpose of Christ, but they have no power. They have no way of stopping what is coming. And there are certain things that are going to happen because God said they're going to happen and they need to happen, but they are not out of his control. He has a plan and a purpose for allowing certain things to happen and he will handle them in due time. And so I gave you a lot of information. I played it, pray that you watch this video, listen to this podcast over and over again, pick it apart, find the parts that you uh, want to ask questions about, or if you want me to clarify, please, I have no problem answering questions and comments. I pray that this blessed you. Remember, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. God bless you. Mm-hmm.